Hello everyone. This week in our critical analysis section, our critical analysis track, I want to talk about research. And in particular, I'm going to probably talk mostly about quantitative research. Um, although I will acknowledge qualitative research and um, discuss a little bit about its importance. My reason for talking about research is that a lot of what we hear in the in social media or in the mass media public uh, discourse is really based on research and research that is done oftentimes in universities or in businesses um, or other forums. Um, but this research produces results that in many ways sort of drives people's attitudes or drives further research or even drives action. And so I want to talk a little bit about how research is created, um, how it's conducted, how it's produced, and what are some of the shortfalls that oftentimes happen in a research type forum. So what is research? Now we talked about this in the previous uh, presentation last week, but I'll talk about it again. Um, when we, you as college students, when you think of research, you're probably thinking of going to the library and looking stuff up. Um, but really, we divide out research to be two different types of research. Um, last year, or last week we talked about three. I'm just going to talk about two, and that's primary and secondary research. Primary research is where the, the research is conducted to create new knowledge, essentially, where there's a question, a research question or a hypothesis, and so the researcher or researchers are conducting experiments or doing some other type of research to create knowledge that just doesn't exist anywhere else so far. So in many cases, it's going to be research that's used to further somebody else's work, where somebody else left kind of a, a couple things that were undone. In many cases, it's going to be something where a researcher is doing something completely new. And the result of that will typically be some sort of presentation or publication, um, sometimes if they're really big, uh, like big conclusions are drawn from the research, it'll hit the social media or it hit the mass media. Secondary research, as I've already alluded to, is really where we're looking at the work of others. Typically, when a primary researcher completes a study, he or she will produce some sort of written record of what was done. It's usually a journal article. It could be something even as big as a book. Um, and then when we later on want to learn about what was, what's known about that particular topic, we can go back and conduct what's called secondary research, where we look at the work of somebody else and we find out what's known about a particular topic. Another way to differentiate between primary research and secondary research is primary research is pursuing what isn't yet known, and secondary research is where we're looking at what has already been known or what's already been written. So here's some examples of primary research that we might look at. So we might want to know what is the example of a particular learning intervention on high school students, and maybe no researcher has ever conducted this type of research before, and this is going to be brand new information for us to generate. Drug companies also do primary research in the sense that they want to know whether or not a drug has its intended impact. When a drug is created and a compound is identified as a potential drug, drug companies do two things that are pretty key, one of which is to check for its safety and the other one is to check for its efficacy. So when there's a new compound being used to treat disease, say let's say diabetes, they will spend years determining whether or not that drug is actually effective on diabetes. Another example might be, what is the best management style given a certain organizational culture? So we can come in and we can assess organizational culture, and we may want to find out what people think or feel about the best management style. We may also want to know, what is the impact of social media on friendships and interpersonal interaction? And there's a lot of conversation going on about stuff like that right now, and it may be some research that has has not yet been done, or it may be some research where somebody's done partial or part of the research, and it's up to us to kind of finish the research or kind of take the research in a different direction. And then lastly, we might want to look at what is the best combination of actions to secure a network from cyber criminals. So that could be, again, a very, very topical uh, conversation, very current conversation, but there may be some research going in to determine the actual best way to secure a network against cybersecurity or for cyber criminals. So there are different types of primary research, and we've talked about this a little bit before, but I'm going to go through it again as well. Um, there's quantitative, and quantitative research is really focused on testing out whether or not one variable has an impact on another variable, and typically those variables are numeric, hence the quant from quantitative. It could also be where we're looking at a number of variables to determine if the combination of those variables has an impact on another variable. Um, and I'll go through several examples later on in the slides, but really when we're talking about quantitative research, we're talking about things that we can measure numerically and whether or not those numeric variables can be correlated to or tied to or aligned to or shown to have some impact 
on another uh, set, another single or set of numeric variables. When we're talking about qualitative research, um, we're going to really talk about the qualities um, or the lived experience or something that is less numeric, something that is more kind of really experiential. And then there's the combination of the two. Um, that's where we're, we're in a situation where we have both numeric and qualitative type information that we want to determine about a particular situation. So we may do a combination of both quantitative and qualitative. So as indicated, quantitative is typically focused on numeric values. And we're looking at the relationship between two variables, and oftentimes it's more than two variables. So what we're really trying to ask is one variable related to another variable, and or does it cause a difference in the other variable? So here's an example. Um, what is the relationship between the number of hours that a college student spends studying each week and his or her GPA? So are those two variables related? Um, does one seem to have a relationship to the other one? Um, and is this relationship important, right? So we could identify that the number of hours studying, studying is one variable and we think it might have a relationship to the GPA. And if those two variables are related, we, there are a number of different quantitative methods that would allow us to determine if that relationship is important or not. With quantitative studies, we are typically looking at things like populations and samples, um, where the sample actually represents the population. So in many cases, what we're trying to do is we're trying to come up with relationships of one variable or multiple variables to another across an entire population. And that population could be all college students in the state of Washington. It could be all college students in the Pacific Northwest. And so what we're gonna do is instead of trying to talk to every single college student in the Pacific Northwest, which would be infeasible, we will instead identify a sample. And that sample is some number, it has to be a sufficient size that when we talk to those students, it would be representative of the overall population. So let's assume for a second that the overall population of uh, college students in the Pacific Northwest is, say, 150,000. Since we cannot talk to 150,000 students across the Oregon, Idaho, and uh, Washington region, what we might do instead is we might pull out a sample size of maybe 250. And that sample has to actually have the same characteristics and the same demographic divisions that the overall population has. It has to look like a mini version of the overall population. So in that 250 people, we would have some number from Oregon, some number from Idaho, some number from Washington State. We would have some number that represented different cultures, um, different racial backgrounds. It would have to be something that was fairly, uh, fairly representative. And so we'll talk to the sample. 250 is a lot more uh, feasible to talk to than 150,000. So we would use that sample to represent the population. If we're careful in doing that, and we've really carefully identified our sample, and our sample truly represents our population, then whatever we find out about the sample can be generalized to the population. And that generalized word is a very common word used in quantitative studies. It's hopefully what we find with our sample, we can then apply to or generalize to the overall population. But there has to be a lot of careful uh, planning in place to ensure that the sample that we've chosen is truly representative of the population. Because if the sample does not represent the population, then the results that we find with the sample cannot be applied back to the population with any sort of confidence. So if we were to, example, for example, check for the relationship between the hours spent studying and the GPA among students at Central Washington U University, maybe we decided we're gonna take that, we're gonna, we're gonna narrow it down to be students in their final year. Um, their final year of their undergraduate programs. So we look at that and we get some results from that. Then we go ahead and we apply that to the larger population. And maybe our larger population is, well, it could be one of two things. It could be college seniors in the state of Washington, or it could be college seniors across the states of Washington, Idaho, and Oregon. How confident can we be that the students that are studying in their senior year at Central Washington University are going to be truly representative of the students that are in their senior years across other institutions? In many cases, we could argue that it's going to be fairly consistent. Seniors are seniors. They're getting ready to finish. Their study habits may have been refined over the first three years of their college experience. So there may be many things that are common, but there also may be many things that are different. There may be different things that are drivers at a private institution versus a public institution, 
or we may have to take into account what is the specialization that the student is pursuing, what degree is the student pursuing. There may be degrees that are, in fact, much, much more demanding when it comes to study time than other degrees. So we would have to take all those things into account to assess whether or not the sample we've chosen, which is all seniors at Central Washington University, is truly representative of all of the students in the population. If we're confident that that's the case, and we can make a defensive or definitive, or, well, not definitive, but a good defense that that's the case, then whatever we learn about the students, the senior students at Central Washington University, we can apply to the larger population. And we can make the same assumptions about that population. And that's really what quantitative studies do, is they look at a sample, they identify a sample. Typically, it's a random identification of a sample that represents a population. They test out their hypotheses on the sample and what they discover they are then able to, assuming this, the results are statistically significant, they are then able to apply those to the overall population. Okay? And it depends on many factors. So, and the reason why I'm going into such detail on population and samples is that as we start turning a critical eye to quantitative studies and the results that are reported in either social media or the mass media, it's important for us to look at where can quantitative studies go wrong. And one of the first places that they can go wrong is either sample size or sample selection. The sample is too small to statistically represent the population, or the sample just doesn't represent the population. There, there are key differences between those that were chosen to make up the sample and the overall population. Yet, many researchers will go on undaunted and report out results from the sample and make assumptions about the population that, in fact, aren't supported. <clears throat> With qualitative research, what we're really doing is we're looking at more of the human side. We're looking at more of the non-numeric factors. And one of the most common things that we look at in a qualitative study are qualities about a particular to a topic or subject. Um, and a good example would be how people feel about a certain subject or topic. We may want to know what the best uh, management style is for a particular organizational culture. Um, we may want to know what people had experienced and how they felt when they went through a particular experience. Um, we may want to know just in general what people's overall experience has been as they've you know, completed college or something like that, right? So we're not asking numerically based questions. We're really asking about what are the qualities? How did you feel? What was your experience? Those kinds of things. So if we want to know how people feel about a certain topic, we'll ask them. We'll ask a uh, group of people who have experienced that particular, that, that particular event to tell us how they feel. And our questions are very organized and they're very carefully constructed um, so that we can get kind of the information that we want. So we ask them and we record all of their responses. And then we review the responses and we identify common themes. What are common things that are people are saying that maybe we talked to 20 people and out of that 20 people, 12 people said the same thing about a particular experience. That would be something that would constitute a common theme. So we focus on the common themes and we share them as the results. We found that most people in the study felt X about Y. And then we can impact the, or we can investigate the impact of those common themes. In this class, we're going to look more at quantitative designs. Although if there's an opportunity for us to sort of take a look at qualitative designs that are being reported out in the media, we'll do that as well. So back to quantitative designs, a good quantitative design. These are the ones that are most often reported in the media, where you hear things like the, the researchers at the Johns Hopkins or researchers at the University of Washington found or something like that. Those are they're more often referring to things that are probably quantitative in nature. So good quantitative designs have to be well structured. You know, we're going to do a quantitative design and we're going to look at one variable's impact on another variable. We have to make sure that we have structured that properly such that we can get to the information that we need about both variables. We can get to enough measurements. We can have a, a large enough sample so that we can represent the population. In a good quantitative design, the sample has to be big enough. Um, again, like I discussed earlier, the sample has to be large enough to be truly representative of the population. A sample that is too small will not take on all of the attributes of the population simply because it can't. There's not enough, there's not enough sample size there. So the sample has to represent the population. The results also have to be interpreted correctly. Oftentimes the results that are, are uh, produced by a quantitative study can be, even though they're reported out by the researcher entirely accurately, when the media picks them up, they don't, they're given more power than they should have. Um, 
we have to make sure that we use proper statistical analysis when we're actually comparing fields, that we do our best to eliminate bias, and that we do not overextend the results. We don't attribute more meaning to the results than they actually have. So study results are often reported in now, usually reported in academic journals or conference proceedings. And so journal editors have to assess the quality of the research before they allow the particular paper into their journal. Um, and most are only interesting to others in the field. So, you know, if we're looking at, at the impact of a particular intervention on education, maybe it's, you know, the reading level of third graders, that's probably going to be something that interests only third grade teachers or people who are teaching elementary reading. So there's not a lot of hoopla that goes around most of these studies, um, except for with people that are actually in the field. But still, the journal editor's job is to ensure that what's being submitted to the journal um, is a quality study, that it has met all of the check boxes that we saw in the previous slide, and that it is actually reporting out results that, can, that we can have a lot of confidence in. But sometimes the studies are big, and they, they, they're a big thing. And what you might hear is there's a lot of work being done in the medical field right now with dementia and uh, Alzheimer's. And there's a lot of progress that's being made. And so whenever something happens in that field that is of significance, um, usually it comes from a study that's being done by a medical unit or by a university. And some breakthroughs is, is, is happening. Um, you'll, you'll see that picked up by the popular media. And you'll also oftentimes, I think one of the most uh, frequently cited journals is the New England Journal of Medicine. And it seems to be sort of the crown jewel of medical journals in the sense that you want to get your, you want to get your papers picked up by the New England Journal of Medicine, um, who's only going to pick them up if it's a substantial medical advance. So if somebody's doing medical research either at a hospital or at a university and they come up with something that could really impact the medical field, it, it could be picked up by the New England Journal of Medicine. Another example would be, you know, researchers at Johns Hopkins. Um, it's a very strong, very, um, very well-known and very famous research university that produces a lot of great researchers. And so it also produces a lot of research. And so you'll see a lot of good stuff come out of that and cited back to Johns Hopkins. But even closer to home, you see a lot of research that comes out of the University of Washington. Um, all three of those institutions, whether it be the journal or the two universities, are doing great work. And oftentimes the work that they're doing is picked up by the popular media. The problem is, does the popular media get it right? Oftentimes it's more about the headline than it is about the accuracy of what's really being reported in the journal or being done by the universities. Study results are often used to support a particular position. And this is where research can really go wrong. Um, and that is when, when the researcher, oftentimes the researcher, when they're conducting studies, there are two things that are at, at, uh, at play here. The first thing is, is that the researcher has a genuine question. And they have a genuine question that there are specific procedures, whether it be quantitative or qualitative, but there are specific, specific procedures that the researcher must follow in order to produce research that is going to be recognized by the, his or her colleagues or the, uh, his peers or journals as being worthy and of quality. So generally that has to follow a number of protocols, not the least of which is that the researcher can't come into it with a particular agenda or bias. The researcher has to be just as fine walking away with a result that is not what he or she expected than they are when they're finding a result that is what they originally were looking for. But that's the nature of research, is sometimes, sometimes what we find is going to back up what we think, and sometimes it's not. Um, either way, we learn something. We learn something, whether it's you know, the direction we want it to go or, or not. And so, and the other piece about it is that the researcher's integrity is on the line. So the researcher is really motivated to use the highest level of standards, the best level of integrity, and the most understandable and transferable methods as far as research methods goes. So it's really important that the researcher produce good results, that they produce good research, um, and that they find uh, that they that find something that they can support and defend. Oftentimes also a uh, researcher's funding sources will depend on the research that he or she is producing. They've received a grant or something like that. And so it will depend on what, you know, the grant will, the continuation of the grant will depend on some level of research being done. Um, and so it's really important that the, the results that the researcher produces are able to stand scrutiny, not only for the fact that there's certain protocols that are in place, 
um, that funding sources can be lost if integrity isn't maintained, but it's also the personal integrity of the researcher. And sometimes it goes wrong. And sometimes there are researchers that are um, tempted to stray away from those good practices. And here are a couple of famous examples. There was a study that was done a number of years ago, and I believe it was out of South Korea, but I can't swear to that. And it was a study that was linking um, uh, autism to vaccines. And it became sort of the rallying cry for the anti-vax movement in the sense that they could point to this one study and say, look, 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 the study said that there was a link. Now, there's a couple of things to think about here. One, and I'll talk about this in a minute, most studies only determine that there's a link to or a relationship between two variables. They never, ever prove anything. What they do is they provide evidence that supports a hypothesis, okay? but it's never 100%, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. And so when the anti-vaxxers were waving the anti-vaccine flag because of its relationship to autism, uh, many of them were saying that vaccines cause autism. No study would ever show that. No study would ever say that. They would say vaccines could be linked to autism, or they could say there's evidence to suggest that vaccines are related to autism, but they could never say that vaccines cause autism because they could never do that study. So, but what happened in this particular case is the years later it was revealed that the researcher falsified his results. And he did it probably because of notoriety. He did it maybe because he was being, you know, pushed in a different direction, who knows? But it became, uh, you know, kind of a career ending move for that particular researcher um, because now the, the anti-vax movement didn't have their rallying cry and because that particular study was no good. There's another great example that we've seen over and over and over again in the last 20 or so years, and that is the whole argument about climate change. There's a number of people who have done studies um, that show that there's enough evidence that says burning fossil fuels contributes carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, and that contribution of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere is leading to climate change. Okay? There's a great deal of research that shows that. But there's a great deal of research that has been purposefully set up and purposefully flawed to show that the opposite is true. And those are usually funded by energy companies, not surprisingly. And so that would be sponsored research in the sense that the energy company is trying to find researchers who will basically give them the result that they want. It's pretty easy to do. Um, and I'll talk about why it's pretty easy to do that um, in a minute. For many years, a third example, for many years, um, there was a claim by the tobacco companies that there was insufficient proof that smoking causes lung cancer. Even into the 90s, when there was a giant court case where several attorneys generals across the country sued the tobacco companies, it was the position of the tobacco companies that there was insufficient proof that smoking causes lung cancer, when in fact we know today that it does. Um, and it's now completely debunked. And even the tobacco companies, in a large part, have accepted that that is a, a finality, that is a, a definite link there between those two. But they used a lot of fake research um, and they used a lot of sort of dodgy kind of methods to get out of actually having to accept what the research was really suggesting. So they can use carefully chosen words. And this is what the media does. And this is what also some researchers do. So they get away from the conclusions that the research is showing them. They can say stuff like there's not enough proof or there's insufficient data. Well, how can they do that? Well, earlier I had said that studies never prove anything. What studies do is they provide evidence to suggest that a particular conclusion is supportable, but it's only supportable at some percentage of confidence, right? So it could be maybe it's 95% confidence. It meets the 95% threshold. We have 95% confidence that the evidence that we're seeing indicates that smoking causes lung cancer, okay? Or that fossil fuels cause, uh, are leading to climate change but there's 5% that's not accounted for. And that 5% that's not accounted for, it doesn't mean that it's on the other side. It doesn't mean that it does, it's, it does not support the conclusion. It means that there's a 5% chance that the results the researcher is looking at are inconclusive. Um, sometimes we set that threshold to 99%. That means there's only a 1% chance, one out of 100% chance that the, result, the results that the researcher got are inconclusive. Very, very low chance that the researcher got an inconclusive result. But it's not zero. And because it's not zero, that means that somebody can point to that 5% or that 1% and say, there's still room for error here. There's still margin for error here. So there's just, there's not enough proof. It's not 100% certain, or there's insufficient data, or there's insufficient proof. And that's what's really happened here is we've looked at a lot of these studies and people will say, well, you know, 
Yeah, they said 95%, but there's still 5% that says that it's not the case. Well, two things. One, it doesn't say that it's not the case. It just says that 5% chance that it is in, it, that we, that we can't find anything conclusive about it. And two, when you're dealing with 5% versus 95%, where 95% says I'm confident in a result and 5% says, well, I'm not so confident in that result, um, that's really, that's not even a fair comparison. It's a one in 20, or in the case of 99, it's a one in 100. But some people still use those, they still fall back on those, and that's how they can get out of um, claiming that a study that is at 95 or 99% confidence level um, it lacks sufficient proof. We can also see that studies can be manipulated. Okay, so if the you know if somebody who's reporting it out either in the mass media um, or social media or somewhere else is you know using some of those weasel words like not enough proof or insufficient evidence, um, the results then can be manipulated. And what's reported out is, for example, instead of saying you know university discovers a ninety five percent confidence level that smoking causes lung cancer. Um, they can twist that around and say um, university is not 100% confident that smoking causes lung cancer. So, and both of those things are true, right? Both of those things are true. We can never be 100% apt, absolutely true in statistics in the way that we do this. But we can be confident enough that we don't really have much of a doubt. So you can see how certain forces could manipulate um, using science, using data, and they just change the way that they interpret the results. And that's why we need to apply a critical eye and critical thinking skills to what we hear, especially even when it's backed up with data. Because if somebody's making a claim, I think the next question that you should ask them is show me the data and then show me the research. How is it done? How much confidence do you have that the, that the results that you're reporting out were are actually founded in, um, in true science? And the other piece about this is, is that sometimes it would appear that those that are reporting in the mass media and the social media don't fully understand the research process and don't fully understand what it is they're reporting. They're going for the headline, and they're going for what is actually going to you know, get them the most attention. So much of what we read or hear is not founded on solid, supportable research. Um, and sometimes in the era of fake news, it may not even be founded on truth. But yet it still gets reported. Um, and so it's really important that we keep an open eye, that we question, and that we wonder about where are these conclusions coming from. So that's why it's important to question conclusions and look for sufficient evidence. One thing we haven't talked about yet is bias. And bias is usually unintentional, but oftentimes can be intentional. And that's where we're going back to the study, whether it's a quantitative or qualitative study, we can go back to the study. And the researcher enters the study process um, with a research question, but he thinks he already knows the answer, right? Or he wants it to be a particular answer. So what will happen is that you'll see throughout the methodology and throughout the data processing and then even the reporting that there's just kind of a bias, there's kind of a push to one direction or another. And that that makes the results less trustworthy. So maybe even the results that the researcher is looking for is um, they are uh, not supported by the data. Or what often happens is that the data are manipulated or changed and the tests are changed such that the researcher keeps going at, after it until he gets what he wants. Right? He finds something that looks significant, looks worthwhile, looks like it will support his conclusions. It's all bias. It's all bias. And that's where it's important for us to make sure that when we are looking at data, we understand where the data came from. Who was behind the data and did they come into it with a really open mind with a great deal of research integrity and were they willing to accept the fact that what they're going to discover in their research is in fact not what they really are looking for in the first place so faults with many studies um, we've talked about many of these but let's just summarize with what these faults are um, in some cases the sample size is not big enough so the sample size being not big enough it also gets to number two where the sample size doesn't really truly represent the population but we go along undaunted and claim that whatever we found with the sample does in fact apply to the population. That can't be supported and that can't be defended. Okay. Number three, the methods that are employed to conduct the research either aren't strong enough or they're not accurate enough or they don't take enough precautions to make sure that they don't get in some way hampered um, by, the, by their own process. Bias has either been, uh, number four, bias has either not been left out or it's been masked or it's not identified, or it's just flat out there, and the, the researcher is going to keep trying to find a result, um, manipulating the data and doing whatever he or she needs in order to get a significant result. 
And then one of the other things that happens very often is that researchers and the media is guilty of this too. In fact, this number five is probably the one the media is most guilty of. They overextend the results to try to make them mean more than they do. So, you know, if a university finds that a particular drug has shown promise in treating Alzheimer's, and they found that it showed promise in treating Alzheimer's because certain markers for Alzheimer's out of a thousand patients, 300 of those patients saw a slight decline in certain markers of Alzheimer's that may or may not be significant or may or may not be meaningful, then the media might pick that up and say, new drug for Alzheimer's has been discovered. N not really. That's not really the truth. What the study is reporting is they're reporting something that has potential to potentially re reverse the effects of Alzheimer's in about 30% of the patients that were tested. Um, but the media doesn't get it that way. The media says new drug for Alzheimer's discovered, and that's that's what makes um, the story exciting. Okay, that is the end of this presentation. Nope, there's one more. Oh, one more slide. Okay, news organizations, and this is basically summarizing what I was just saying. News organizations often report the results of studies. Uh, what do we hear? We hear research, researchers proved. Well, no, they don't. Remember, studies never prove anything. They suggest evidence of something to some level of confidence, but they never prove anything, okay? And they also, we see it on the other side, there is not conclusive proof that, that may be true, there's not conclusive proof because we can't be 100% confident that a particular study has proven anything because we're not gonna get to that 100% confidence level. But on the other side, it would be extremely likely that the researchers, what the researchers are suggesting um, was found in the study, but that it's wrong because the, the probability that it's not significant is so small. So we hear this kind of thing in politics too, right? Politics, we're going to talk about politics in a later module, but politics uses this kind of methodology and uses this kind of sort of reporting of things that are not quite accurate um, often. And we hear it in advertisements and we hear it in social media. So you have to use a critical eye. You have to look at what you're being told and question, where did it come from? How is it derived? And are they overextending what, what they're claiming? Um, we'll talk more about this in later modules, um, but uh, this one is summarizing uh, research. Okay.